Okay, so today we go to continue and finish about the cosmological perturbation. And uh, this, in some sense, is uh, just a continuation of what we saw yesterday. And if you remember yesterday, we finished with the fact that we can define a kind of gauge invariant perturbation. Which was this V, which I can write as a, a square delta phi plus the uh, phi dot over h the uh, potential. So this one is the Newtonian potential. This one is the fluctuation in the field. And uh, this one is also equivalent to A times R, which is really the fluctuation in the Ricci curvature in the three dimension. And for this uh, variable, in principle, you could do everything just starting with this quantity and quantize this uh, quantity. Uh -huh. You get actually an equation for this quantity, which is very similar to the one in the Fourier space we had before. So that's why and you have then, uh, instead of having uh, the a double prime over a here, instead you have a z the double prime over z, where z is the variable which takes into account everything. It takes into account the fact that you have, uh, so you can define the z variable to be the scale factor, which would be the same as we had uh, the other day, yesterday. But then you have also, you can add a phi dot over h. And therefore, that when you derive z, you, t you see that if uh, uh, phi dot and h are constant, this will give me exactly the equation I had yesterday. But of course, h and phi dot are not exactly constant, and they de deviate from constant exactly by something which is related to this Laurel condition we saw yesterday. So this means that this one is the same as the variable a, up to correction which go like uh, this Laurel parameters. And this means that in principle, as I said again, if you solve this equation, you get a slight correction to the result I, I gave you yesterday. The fact that you have also, uh, if you want, uh, also a, a slight scale dependence, because the Hubble parameters and the velocity are not exactly constant. And therefore, you have that every, depending on which time the mode exits the, uh, exits the horizon, you have a slight different uh, uh, normalization of the spectrum. But at the end, you can write it down in the f uh, this form. So if you write the power spectrum for the primordial fluctuation, since phi dot and h, you can always relate to the potential, if you remember yesterday, in the slow roll approximation. h is the potential, practically, and phi dot is the first derivative of the potential. I can rewrite everything as a factor of the potential. And I obtain, at the end, the formula I also show you or wrote you yesterday, which is something like this. Uh, well, I think I wrote it with the GN, but um, well, let me write it with the Planck. It's the same. Uh, it's perhaps uh, a bit more compact. V cube over V prime squared computed at the horizon exit. This is the power spectrum that would be constant if everything would be, uh, as I said, uh, constant, both h and phi dot. But then I have an uh, additional dependence on the scale, which is a power law, which is an ns minus 1. And uh, this ns is very near to 1. So that's why usually, uh, well, it's a bit a stupid way to write it, ns minus 1. Perhaps uh, people could have written directly the slower condition. But uh, 1 was the reference, uh, if you want, uh, yeah. So n w ns equal to 1 is the reference horizon Zeldovich spectrum, which was proposed in the early days as the best fit of the data. And actually, it turns out that it's not the best fit of the data nowadays, as we, see, as, uh, we know from the, from the CMB. 
But the deviation of ns from 1 is exactly connected to the slow roll parameter I defined yesterday. The eta parameter connected to the second derivative of the potential and the epsilon parameter connected to the first derivative of the potential. Okay? So you see then immediately uh, that uh, you get a slight deviation from a perfectly scale invariant spectrum due to the fact that uh, inflation in some sense goes on and it's not a pure de Sitter phase, it's a quasi de Sitter. So there is a slight slope in the potential and you have also a slight change of the Hubble parameter during inflation. But the change is pretty small because indeed an S minus one has been uh, measured by uh, Planck and we will see in a minute the the figure, it is actually pretty uh, small. Um, NS minus one, I mean, not NS. So the other thing I didn't cover completely yesterday is the fact that, as we saw in the fluctuation, there is only the also the tensor fluctuations. So we have the uh, the tensor H I J, and if we write the equation for the tensor H I J J. So you have also, if you want, the tensor perturbation Hij. Now, for Hij, I don't have any contribution from inflation, OK? Inflation doesn't give you any vector or any tensor fluctuation. There is only the scalar fluctuation, delta phi, which contributes to the scalar. So you could also say, OK, I don't have an anything. But actually, that's not true, because if you write down the equation for the uh, tensor perturbation, you get again an equation of a harmonic oscillator. And you get again, a, if you want, the equation for the modes. Uh, here I suppress the ij indices. Uh, assume that you can project the, the h to the two polarization state okay, that you can have in gravity. So then at the end, uh, you can, for each of them, you can write an equation of this form which is again a k square minus 2 over eta square, which is again my conformal time, h of k is equal to 0. I recall you this one is nothing else as again at a double dot over a. So in this case, actually, you have again a similar solution to the solution we discussed yesterday, because this one in some sense is also a massless field, only it's not a scalar, it's a tensor, but it's a massless field in the background of a, an expanding universe. And in this case, of course, the source of the fluctuation, as in the case of the inflaton, are again, if you want, the vacuum fluctuation. So I would expect H to have a fluctuation in the vacuum in the same way as delta phi had. And in that sense, these you have again the same prediction that if you compute the vacuum expectation value of uh, this is practically the only case you have is the Hubble scale and you get something which is an h square over uh, uh, 4 pi. This uh, means that apart from having a uh, fluctuation in the scalar sector, so this is the curvature perturbation, I have also a perturbation in the tensor. The tensor has a slight different behavior in this case, you see here I have exactly a double dot over a and not the z variable I as I had there. And uh, this is exactly because this is not directly connected to the potential. It doesn't really care about the potential. What it cares about is just that you have a uh, de Sitter phase and a Hubble expansion. So in that sense, it's not uh, sensitive to, for example, the velocity of the inflaton, but it, it still feels that the Hubble parameter is changing during inflation. And at the end, if you write uh, the power spectrum for, the, uh, for this case, you find uh, something which just depends on the potential, because the potential sets the scale, or if you want, is the Hubble parameter during inflation. Sorry, here I write it as a particular scale again, and then I rewrite. There is also here in this case a slight dependence on the uh, scale, which is coming again from the fact that you have, uh, this is the NT, the tensorial spectral index. And in this case, as I said, the uh, 
and t depends only on the fact that the Hubble parameter is not constant. If the Hubble parameter would be perfectly constant, this one would be exactly 1. I would have no change with the scale. But the, we know that the change of the Hubble parameter is actually coming from the derivative uh, the of Hubble is epsilon. So this uh, change of here scale is just connected to epsilon and not to eta. Remember, eta is the second derivative instead. It in some sense, is the mass of the inflaton. So in the case of the scalar spectrum, you notice if the inflaton has a potential and what the mass of the inflaton is in some sense. In the case of the tensor perturbation, you just notice that the Hubble parameter is changing with time. Okay? And this is explains why are I have two different uh, spectral indices, and they have also two different normalizations. Notice that the tensor perturbation have the big advantage that if you would be able to measure them, they would give us immediately direct information of what the value of the potential during inflation. Instead, in the case of the curvature perturbation, it's a combination of the potential and the first derivative. This means, of course, uh, s first of all, you can always conclude immediately that since, since usually the potential is flat, the first derivative of the potential is smaller than the potential, therefore usually the Scalar perturbation are always larger than the tensor perturbation. And actually, you can define what is the, the tensor to scalar ratio, which is r, which is usually some 4 factor, which is approximately 4t, the power spectrum in the tensor perturbation over the power spectrum in the uh, curvature perturbation. And this is usually a small number. You can plug in these uh, expressions here exactly, and you find that this is actually exactly in the slow roll approximation proportional to epsilon. Okay? And this is nothing else as the fact that here you have again a v prime square. Remember, v prime square divided by v will give you exactly uh, the epsilon parameter. So I can rewrite the definition somewhere. So epsilon is one half v prime over v squared. Okay. This means that uh, generically we would expect to have from inflation both scalar perturbation and tensor perturbation. We expect the tensor perturbation to be suppressed due to the slow roll, if you want, or due to the fact that the Hubble parameter is pretty. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's changing pretty uh, slowly. And uh, in principle, we would like to measure both of them. Now, what are the tensor perturbations? Gravitational waves. They are gravitational waves, practically. This HIJ tensor is nothing else as what I also can interpret as a gravitational wave. So these tensor perturbations contribute to the uh, gravitational background, primordial background of gravitational waves. And at the same time, uh, they also generate, if you want, back scalar perturbation or temperature fluctuations. So they also have an effect, of course, in the plasma. So that means they would also change the behavior, for example, of the CMB. And in particular, the tensor perturbation would actually change the polarization of the CMB. This is why we could, in principle, be able to measure the tensor perturbation through a measurement of the polarization of the CMB. And there was a lot of excitement a few years ago because the BICEP experiment uh, uh, yeah, practically announced that they had measured tensor perturbations. It turns out that actually what they measure uh, is uh, background so or foreground. So it's actually something which is not produced by the inflationary epoch, but comes from the gas in between and, the, in some sense, uh, the interaction of the photons on the way to the Earth. And so unfortunately, we have not measured the tensor perturbation yet. We have only limits on the tensor perturbations. Okay. And I will uh, try to plot, to show the plot, or to plot the plot, to draw the plot myself from Planck. So usually, Planck, of course, does not measure only the primordial spectrum. So you have the primordial spectrum, and then you have the evolution of the fluctuation. We will discuss it that in a minute, a bit more in detail. But what happens is, of course, that you can try to extract the primordial spectrum from the uh, uh, 
cosmic microwave background, uh, temperature fluctuations. And practice, uh, this is what Planck has been trying to do or has been doing. Not only Planck, also before there were WMAP and uh, other experiments doing the similar job. And what is usually typically to plot is the plot of the spectral index versus the uh, tensor to scalar ratio. Okay, and uh, I can try to draw the plot of Planck. So usually you have something like one here. So one is actually excluded. So that is an important thing because in the old days uh, the Harrison-Zeldovich was actually the preferred uh, spectrum. You have uh, 0 0.98, 0 0.96, 0 0.94. And on the other axis, you have uh, something like 0 0.1, 0 0.05, etc. And then you have contours from Planck around something like this and this up to sigma. If I am, well, of course, it depends a little which contour you look at. Uh, there are different priors you can take and different data sets, but the contour looks a little bit like this. Uh, there are, uh, yeah, so one sigma and two sigma contours of the data. You see that it looks like the spectral index, as I said, it's relatively far from one. So we have really seen that there is a deviation. So in some sense, uh, inflation has a sufficiently fast roll that you have a deviation from ns minus one and uh, moreover uh, the important quantity we have an upper bound uh, sorry uh, uh, yeah we have a practically an upper bound on the uh, tensor to scalar ratio so we ha must be lower than something like 0.1 and uh, if you plot what happens in the case of m square phi square inflation for example these would be something like here Depending on the number of E folding that you choose, this would be something like m square phi square. So this is exactly the uh, statement I was uh, giving you yesterday that m square phi square is practically excluded. If you go to lambda phi to the fourth, it's even higher. And uh, there are other polynomial uh, expressions, as I said. Actually, the linear one is really more or less on the boundary. So if you want to have just a linear, potential and then of course if you have a square root or other strange uh, well functions which are uh, less strong than a power law then you are within the contour and actually the important uh, one other important model which is now pretty popular is the what is called the Starobinsky model which is actually lying more or less here in the center of the ellipse which is the one which is connected to adding a non-minimal coupling to the inflaton. So up to now, what I described, I always assume the inflaton has a, a canonical kinetic term and everything, all the things which are different from canonical are in the potential. Uh, of course, you can do something more complicated or, well, not more complicated at the end because it's equivalent. You can do a different type of uh, models. The Starobinsky model were proposed in the even before good, good model of inflation, and they were proposed at that time uh, through um, a R square term. So practically, you do gravity with R, but then you have a, a, a R square. So here would be an R square gravity term, and then you can, in some sense, do inflation without caring about a. In, uh, an inflaton, if you want a scalar field, you can do the I I just inflation through the curvature scalar. Now, of course, you probably know that uh, this is actually equivalent because the curvature scalar, if you have a R square gravity, you can always rewrite it into a scalar plus uh, the normal gravity. And if you do this redefinition, this will give you actually something like a potential and then a non-minimal coupling to gravity. So for example, you have usually is written as psi phi uh, square r square, r term, sorry, not r square. And in this case, of course, this term here is a term which contributes, you remember the Einstein-Hilbert action is m Planck square half r, okay? So this means if you add a term like this and you have a large expectation value for the scalar field, what you're effectively doing is changing the Planck scale, okay? 
<laughs> so if you write down everything in this uh, kind of uh, setting, you find out that the field phi I'm writing here is not canonically normalized. So if you do all the redefinitions uh, of the field, you find out that, for example, a polynomial potential can still work because this uh, change uh, of the Planck scale, if you want to the redefinition of the field, redefines also the potential, and the potential becomes uh, flat. In some sense, it gets actually a exponential behavior. So you start with a potential which something like this, and you end up with a potential which uh, does something like, sorry, this is, of course, smooth. You have a kind of exponential flattening at large field values. Okay? So in that sense, saying that the polynomial potential are excluded is as gain. I, uh, they are excluded if you assume a minimal coupling uh, to the gravity, but if you write this no minimal coupling, you can still uh, also have uh, this case of um, polynomial uh, potential, but in that case you would lie here, practically, what, uh, in the region which is R square. And actually nowadays there are people who also found models where you can interpolate practically between the R square behavior and the polynomial behavior. So you can in some principle find models which go all the way uh, from, from the large R to small R. Okay, so this one's just to have a, an idea. Yes? So, but um, if, if, if you add such a term like R squared to the Lagrangian, and, and you say that it is not sufficiently suppressed, then, um, then, then what about terms like R menu, R menu, for instance? Why don't you also have to take them into account then? Well, in principle, yes, in the sense that, of course, this term, even if you don't put it, you would generate uh, by quantum correction. Okay? So, because in gravity, you would generate this term. So, generically, if you look at any model, even with xi equal to zero, you generate a xi different from zero from quantum correction. Usually, of course, the argument is the quantum correction is small, so I don't care about it. But in practice, you should include it in the sense that it is generated by quantum correction. And of course, if you want, uh, you should probably include also the other, uh, if you want uh, dimension four operators. And of course, uh, the problem for gravity, as usual, is that it's not normalizable. So if you would go higher, you would also have to include the higher order terms. No, I understand, but I mean the, 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 the term R menu, R menu would have the same dimension as R. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, there are actually three terms that you can add also with R square. Uh, one actually in four dimension is, uh, is not independent of the other two, so I think there are two independent terms you can add. Um, in principle, uh, you, could, you should add them in the sense that you, would, you, you do generate them from quantum correction. And uh, usually the point is how large is the coefficient in front. Uh, if the coefficient, of course, is sufficiently small, you would not expect them to change too much the dynamic. But yeah. But generically, that is always the point with gravity. Uh, yeah, when we do inflation, we look at it a, a little bit like uh, in the semi-classical uh, uh, kind of perspective, so that we add, for example, often quantum correction coming from the inflaton field, but we do not always add all the correction coming from gravity. Okay? And uh, this is a little bit, as I said, uh, justified by the fact that we don't have a full uh, quantum theory of gravity, so we don't have really uh, complete control of, of the correction coming from the gravitational sector. Of course, otherwise, I mean, if you st stick to a particular order in R, in principle you could write down all the terms, and uh, you could also estimate what is the size of the uh, coefficient you need in order to be compatible, for example, with the RGEs and things like that. Yeah. Okay, so this one was a little bit to tell you what is uh, happening uh, with the fluctuation and the connection to the scale. Uh, sorry, I forgot to say another thing. Um, what is the scale of the fluctuation? The scale of fluctuation which we measure, so if you want not the scale dependence but just the, the scale, is something like 10 to the minus 10. Okay? 
So it is quite a quite small fluctuation. And this one is already putting you also an upper bound on the uh, tensor perturbation, which means also an upper bound on the potential during inflation. So if you plug in V over M Planck with less than 10 to the minus 10, you find immediately that the scale of inflation cannot be the Planck scale. Okay? It's actually more something like 10 to the 15 GeV, the maximal scale possible. Of course, since we don't have measure, not measure R, we could have also much lower scale, and R could be even 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, we don't know. Okay? So you have actually a quite a range of models uh, which go down also to very, very small r. So unfortunately, experimentally, uh, as you see here, the scale here is 0.1. This is where we have the limit now. And in the future, we may be able to in improve the limit by one order of magnitude. There are some discussion if you can go down two orders of magnitude. But we will never be able probably to go down to 10 to the minus 6 or something like that. So in that sense, uh, this is one of the uh, yeah, dangers, or if you want, if you have a high scale inflation, you, we may be able to measure the R parameter perhaps uh, in the next generation of experiments. But of course, if you write, uh, it, there are also the possibility of having models of inflation where the potential is pretty much smaller than the Planck scale. And there, in some sense, with R is very small, it's uh, much more difficult to, uh, to measure it. So, but as I said, I don't want to be too negative about this. Of course, there is still a possibility that we will be able to measure the uh, um, tensor to scalar ratio and to be able really to know what is the scale of inflation, which is, of course, would be also incredibly useful to know what kind of model we have to, to build. Okay, so as you probably saw here, I have not discussed practically any model apart the polynomial model. And uh, why? Because there are too many models I could discuss. Okay? In practice, uh, you just need a potential which is sufficiently flat. The potential can come from many arguments. Uh, there are potentials which are justified by string theory. There are potentials which you can write down by symmetries. For example, you have a Goldstone mode and then you have a kind of uh, cosine potential. You can write potentials uh, connected to, for example, symmetry breaking like hybrid inflation. So there are quite a huge number of uh, different models that you can do on inflation. And usually the only problem is that uh, all of them in some sense gives you the two number in this uh, plot. And as I said, some models are already excluded, but there are quite a number yet still which are within the experimental region, experimental measured region. And uh, in at the moment it's uh, practically impossible to distinguish, if you want, between them. Okay? In the past, there was a bit of the hope that we could have additional information from inflation. Uh, this additional information would be something a little bit more exotic than what I discussed. For example, one could have a spectral index which changes with scale. So if you want the running of the spectral index, as it's called, or you could have had uh, something like uh, some breaking of the slow roll condition during inflation, so some kind of uh, epoch of fast roll in between uh, slow roll phases. And this, for example, would uh, change really the spectrum a lot. You would not have something so scale invariant, but you would have some kind of uh, strange fluctuation in the spectrum. Or you could have, for example, also non-Gaussianities. Non-Gaussianities could ar arise if the inflaton potential is a bit more complicated than just uh, m square phi square. If you have an interaction for the inflaton field, you would expect, for example, that you could generate also three-point function and four-point function in the inflaton field. And this could give you exactly non-Gaussianity also in the, in the power spectrum of the fluctuation. Uh, as you probably know, this was also a big field uh, some time ago. People were really hoping to see non-Gaussianity in the CMB. And at the moment, unfortunately, there are only limits. And actually, the level of non-Gaussianity, which is seen actually in the CMB, is actually uh, compatible with the level of non-Gaussianity you would expect from the fact that the CMB travels through the matter uh, content of the universe. And uh, in some sense, it is lensed uh, by the structure that is present and uh, in some sense uh, assume some non-Gaussian feature due to the fact that is, uh, the lensing is non-Gaussian. Okay? Yes? So, 
Yes, the 14 factor is connected a little bit to the transfer function of the two uh, power spectra, uh, and this is actually valid for the CMB if you want, and it also depends on the scale at which you are measuring it. So this uh, R is usually, you have to define a value of K if you want, of a scale where you compute the ratio, because they have a different dependence on K, even if it's not a, a big deal, but there is still a slight uh, change. And uh, there is a, uh, practically one particular scale which has been chosen. And at that scale, this is the ratio which comes from the transfer functions. Okay? Because, of course, you, this power spectrum you have then to transfer into the behavior of the CMB. And this will give you actually an additional dependence on the, uh, if you want, on the wavelength. We will see it in a minute also a little bit uh, approximately, not exactly the full uh, transfer function. Why are you not looking at the, <coughs> the vector modes? I mean, in principle, you could also write something similar down for the vector modes, no? Yes, for the vector modes, you have an equation which is similar to this one, it's because you don't have any, again, uh, we do in the from inflation, you don't expect any generation of the vector modes. And the same is true for the de tensor modes, right? Well, it's... Uh, the point of the vector modes is that if you write at the equation, actually, usually you have only the decreasing mode. Um, now I'm starting to, trying to think wha why it is different than from the tensor mode. Um, because on linear level, the tensor mode should also only decay. No? Yes. Uh, well, of course, there is uh, always a decreasing mode and the constant mode. In some sense, there is no growing mode, at least not during inflation. But here you s still have the constant mode, which is exactly the same we discussed with the inflaton, and this is the mode which survived until today. For the vector modes, I think you don't have the constant mode, but now I don't remember exactly why. I will look it up and... Uh, just, just principle, I should also take into account and could calculate ratios and put bounds. You could, yes, you could. Uh, of course, the problem of the uh, vector modes are that um, yeah, you need something which, in some sense, breaks Lorentz invariance to generate a, a vector mode. So in the vector mode also, if you if you average it, uh, you would at the end uh, um, not have a particular direction which is uh, chosen out. So, of course, you could That's still have the quadratic. Okay, you could still have the power spectrum, of course, to be non non zero exactly, but. Um, yeah, well, I have to, I have to check, uh, and I, I can tell you later. Well, in some sense, it's a bit against the GR, because GR is not a scalar tensor vector theory, but only a tensor theory. Mm -hmm. And in, in inflation, we add a scalar just by hand by the inflaton field. So if you look at the uh, GR plus uh, inflaton, you would expect to have only scalar and tensor. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, it's a I think it's a little bit also this argument that you, uh, you would not expect to have a vector around uh, or ar um, in the original theory, since you have, I mean, if you stick to GR, you don't have any vector degrees of freedom. So GR is pure, pure tensor, so there is no vector, no scalar. But nonetheless, they would be sourced later on, right? And then the latent velocity. Well, yes, you have, uh, you have velocity uh, for flows, for example, and you have peculiar velocities, for example, field. Uh, the peculiar velocity field is a vector field, yes. So when you have structure formation, you start to have, yeah. OK, so let me go. Uh, Try to go a little bit faster. <laughs> so the issue is what happens to the fluctuations. As I said, the fluctuations then are constant during inflation when they are outside the horizon. But at a certain point, we would like them to come back inside the horizon. And uh, in that sense, uh, we can write again uh, the similar equations we had uh, yesterday for the fluctuation with the um, perfect fluid um, type of uh, um, uh, of uh, background. So in the case, of course, after inflation, we describe again the energy content of the universe as a perfect fluid with a density and a pressure. And in this case, on top of it, of course, we put fluctuation in the density, fluctuations in the pressure, and we try to compute what is the dynamic of the field. <coughs> 
Uh, what turns out, of course, since I am already putting in the hydrodynamic hypothesis, is that the equations I get out are actually more or less hydrodynamic equations that we saw also yesterday. So what we get out of it is uh, the continuity equation, the Euler equation, and the Poisson equation. So I will just uh, give you the, the equations. I'm not going to derive them. So you c have a practically a perfect fluid plus fluctuations. And the fluctuations are, as usual, uh, the, as I said, the, I can write them as a delta rho. And I was, we use a variable, a delta rho over rho zero, where rho zero is the homogeneous uh, we want density, and we call this delta. And have, of course, a velocity fluctuation. And this is exactly one of these vector fluctuations. And uh, I will have, of course, the uh, delta phi, or phi, actually I call it phi yesterday, so let me call it phi. This is the gravitational potential. So if you remember yesterday I said uh, that I, uh, in uh, conditions when the energy momentum tensor is uh, diagonal, you can uh, reduce the uh, two psi and phi uh, gravitational uh, fluctuation to only one, because they are related to each other. And moreover, if you are after inflation, the inflaton has disappeared. So there is no fluctuation in the inflaton field anymore. So you are left only with this one uh, gravitational fluctuation. So this is the, if you want, this is the Newtonian potential. And as I said, you can write the dynamics of this equation always from the Einstein's equation uh, the, in the perturbative level, so at the first order in the perturbations. And what you obtain is the following equations. You have the derivative of delta plus 1 over a, the gradient of the velocity is equal to 0. So the divergence, sorry, of the velocity fluctuation. You have the derivative of the uh, velocity fluctuation, which has a Hubble term, a pressure term, and the gravitational force term. And then, of course, for the gravitational potential, I have the usual Poisson equation. OK. So the first one is nothing else as the continuity equation we had yesterday or the other day, only that I am writing it with delta rho over rho. So you see that in practice, the 3h rho plus p, et cetera, it's already included in the, the behavior of rho 0. So it disappears from this equation, but it's practically there. The second equation is practically the Euler equation for the velocity. So this is Euler. Here, in this case, I am assuming uh, no peculiar velocity. So the velocity is actually coming from the Hubble flow, if you want. The fact that you have a velocity depending on the expansion of the universe. So this one is the continuity. And the last one is Poisson. So the source of the gravitational, uh, uh, if you want, uh, perturbations, it's the perturbation in the, in the um, density. And uh, these three equations you can combine together to get an equation only for the delta, for the density contrast. And you obtain the following equation. You have, again, the second derivative of delta. You have, in this case, a delta, an h term. You have the pressure term. Ah, sorry, I didn't tell you what is Cs. I will come in a minute. <coughs> And then I have, of course, the force coming from the gravitational potential. Cs here is actually, this term here would be actually a term which is connected to the pressure. 
and I can rewrite it as a function of the density by defining the speed of sound, which is nothing else as the change of pressure depending on a change of density at uh, constant entropy. Okay? So n this is uh, what is called uh, sound speed. Notice that this is not always related to the uh, equation of state, because this you're taking the change at a fixed entropy. And in principle, you have an additional terms if you have a change also of uh, entropy. And um, yeah, so and in this, in some sense, can be often can be also different from uh, the W parameter we had uh, the yesterday, which is ins instead the background pressure divided by the background density. But in some cases, for example, for uh, for the case of radiation, they are exactly the same. So it's a factor of one third. OK, so when else I have this equation, so this term here is due to the pressure. And so it should be also clear that uh, the pressure is present only if I have, for example, radiation. But if I have only non-relativistic matter, we saw yesterday, and we will see perhaps in the thermodynamic later on, the pressure is actually zero. If the pressure is, is zero, also the fluctuation of the pressure is <laughs> divided by the fluctuation of the density is zero. So the sp sound speed in matter is zero. And uh, this means this term will actually disappear in the case of matter domination. But if we go to Fourier space again, we could play also other game and go to a conformal time. But I will not do it now because it's, I mean, in principle, this is the usual thing one you could do to get rid of this 2h delta dot. But uh, let me go a bit faster. And then I have a cs square over a square k square minus 4 pi gn rho 0 <laughs> delta is equal to 0. So you see immediately here, which you have an equation similar to the one we already discussed yesterday. In the sense, it's a linear differential equation. So it's, again, a kind of harmonic oscillator with friction. But a part of having friction, it's again, there is a negative contribution to the master. And uh, in principle, also, the, all of this depends on time. Because, of course, the density of the background depends on time. The scale factor here depends on time. So this means the mass term of this fluctuation changes with time. And in particular, it can also change sign, as uh, again we have seen. Here, in this case, I can also, again, define a scale which corresponds to the scale where this quantity goes to 0. And this is called the Jeans scale, or Jeans uh, wavelength, or whatever. Well, I can define first k, and then, of course, I can define whatever from there. You can see that you can uh, rephrase uh, this one. It is uh, Nothing else are uh, the square root of 4 pi gn rho 0 divided uh, cs square times the scale factor. OK? And now uh, you can also write uh, on the, if you want, you can write instead the physical space, uh, physical scale, which is a bit more. Uh, perhaps interesting. This is uh, nothing else as um, uh, a of t divided by k genes. And uh, this one is practically a cs divided by the 4 pi gn rho 0. Now, if you remember, 8 pi thirds gn rho 0 was actually h square. Okay? So in this case, if h is dominated by this density, then I, this one is nothing else as cs uh, divided h. Okay? So this is, in some sense, is the sound horizon at the particular time. Of course, it's time dependent, this quantity. And the Hubble time is usually going like 1 over time. So this is actually growing. This scale is growing with time. 
Now we can uh, immediately see what is the behavior of the fluctuation for scales which are larger or smaller than the genes uh, scale. For scales which are uh, larger, sorry, smaller, then the k here is larger. This means again this term is dominating in the equation and this gives me exactly an uh, oscillation. And these oscillations are usually called, for example, in the plasma, they are nothing else as the sound waves that we see also in the CMB. Okay? On the other hand, if I have lambda, which is uh, larger than this uh, scale, then of course, in this sense, the second term dominates, and I don't have an oscillation anymore. I could, in principle, have a growth, because this is a negative mass. If I have a growth or not, depend on the interplay between this term and the friction term. If the friction dominates, I don't have a growth. If the friction doesn't dominate, I can have a growth. Okay? And uh, this is exactly what happens. So during radiation dominance, what happens is that the growth is very slow. It's actually mostly logarithmic because the friction is pretty large. Of course, what happens instead if I am in matter domination? I don't have CS anymore. CS is equal to zero. This term drops immediately. And I have then only the negative mass term. So there I have already, uh, in some sense, the growth is goes to all wavelength. I don't have to worry about the wavelength anymore. On the other hand, again, you have to see if the friction or the, of the, or the mass term dominates in the evolution. And what happens is that for the case of matter domination, the, the mass term, in some sense, is the strongest uh, um, dependence. And you obtain, actually, a growing mode. So I can also give you the expression. So we have, therefore, uh, so in radiation dominance, as we saw, we have the two regimes where, as I said, if lambda physical Sorry, it is uh, smaller than the gene's length. You have oscillations. Or if you want sound waves. If lambda physical is larger than the genes, Then, as I said, you can have growth or not. It depends on the evolution, on the interplay between uh, friction and, uh, and the master. So uh, as I said, in the case of uh, matter, what happens is practically that the gene's length becomes 0. So CS, sorry, becomes infinity. So you don't have the, to care about uh, the gene's length anymore. And you can always look, you're always in this uh, last case. And uh, what you can, uh, uh, let me say, wait a second. Okay. Yes, that was we correct. So I can give you the, co the solution in the case of the matter dominance. In principle, we could also derive it. It's not so incredibly different, difficult. So in the case of uh, matter domination, <laughs> the equation, you can write it in this form, is a double dot k plus uh, 2h double dot of k. Here for any k it's the same because there is no more k dependence. And you have then at the 3 half h square delta k is equal to 0. And here you have also as usual that h goes like 1 over t. So you have in some sense uh, a power law behavior for h square. So you could try, for example, to look at a power law behavior also for delta. And it turns out that this is indeed a right uh, uh, solution to find. You could try to do it. 
but let me give you directly the, the answer. You find out that one solution goes like the Hubble parameter. And you can also try to put it there to see if it, it, it would fit, and actually it, uh, um, it does. And then you have a second solution which you can obtain using the Vronskian, uh, which is, in this case, an integral of a squared h squared. If you do the computation, in the case of uh, matter dominance, we know what h is and also what a, uh, how a goes. So we have that a of t in matter dominance goes like t to the two thirds. And as I said, h of t is as usual, if you want, is 2 thirds 1 over t. And you can uh, then do the integral. And the, you have the integral, of course, of uh, t to the 2 thirds divided by dt, which is nothing else as 3 fifths t to the 5 thirds. And then, but you have an h of t in front. So if you combine h of t, which has a 1 over t, with a t to the 5 thirds, what you obtain here is something which is, again, proportional for to a of t. OK? So you, we have, again, the remember, h of t is decreasing, is 1 over t. So as the time goes on, h goes down. So this is the decreasing mode. This one is the growing mode. And it grows like a of t. Therefore, it should be clear that uh, we can, in some sense, make the fluctuation grow. Because uh, this mode will bring us from uh, 10 to the minus 4 to uh, a much larger fluctuation. In particular, we can. We can compute it a little bit. OK. So the delta fluctuation, the delta rho over rho, so delta grows like A of t in the matter dominance. If you would solve the same during uh, radiation dominance, as again, in radiation dominance, you have also the k thing to take into account. But even if for the modes where the k is not important, or k is equal to 0, you nevertheless have that the growth is much slower. It is, well, a logarithmic growth. So in that sense, is you can more or less neglect it, or you can consider it, but it's not a very big uh, effect. But in this case, of course, we can see, therefore, that if you have a fluctuation at the equilibrium time, the equilibrium, sorry, the equality time, this is the time where you have the same density in radiation and matter divided by the fluctuation, or the opposite actually, sorry, I want the opposite. I want to know what is the fluctuation today. at the time of equality, this is nothing else as the ratio of the scale factors. And this ratio of scale factors, if you remember as I defined, this is nothing else as 1 plus z equality. OK? This means that I can't directly compute, because I know, in principle, what is the density of uh, radiation today, what is the density of matter today. I can scale them back to uh, the, the early time and find out what is the value of z where the two were equal. Okay? If you remember, the omega matter goes like 1 plus z cubed, the omega radiation goes like 1 plus z to the fourth. OK? So this one are equal to 1, means that 1 plus z equality is nothing else 
as the omega matter today divided omega radiation. And this, you already know, this one is more or less one third. Omega radiation is actually pretty small today. You can count the photons and the, uh, and the neutrinos. Of course, I mean, as I said, CMB and also BBN um, do measure how many relativistic degrees of freedom we have. And you obtain which, uh, something which is of the order, this is something of the order 10 to the minus 4, this is something of a fraction, it is more or less one third 10 to the 4. So this is my back of the envelope computation. Actually, you can do better because you can measure it in the CMB. Because in the CMB, you have exactly the time of growth from the equality to the time of the coupling of the CMB. And you find out that this one is in the measured by the CMB are to be about 3,400. OK? So you see immediately that we need such a long time of matter dominance in order for the fluctuation to grow from a 10 to the minus 4 at the CMB time to something of order 1 today. It should be clear that uh, this is, of course, depending on the wavelength, if you want, because you always have to, um, yeah, I mean, this is practically the maximal growth you can have. And uh, it's also clear that you can, uh, this is the computation is done in the linear regime. So at a certain point, I will also, when delta becomes sufficiently large, I start to enter the non-linear regime. And then in some sense, uh, my computation breaks down. So the fact that, uh, as I said, I can gain another factor of 10 in the fluctuation. So in some cases, the fluctuation today are also larger than one. But you can uh, also explain it uh, because when you start to go non-linear, the fluctuation grow even stronger. Okay. Uh, yes. What is the temperature at which we have? Uh, like that. What is the temperature of T equality roughly? T equality is approximately, um, well, I don't remember, but okay, one can compute it. Uh, the temperature of the coupling of the CMB is uh, more or less uh, one electron volt, and uh, this is uh, 1,100 in Z. So this is the Z of the CMB. Mm -hmm. And so this one is a factor larger, so three electron volts, something like that. Well, uh, yeah. So you know, it's uh, the electron volt uh, temperature. Uh, okay. Yeah, so the other thing I wanted to plot very briefly uh, was, of course, uh, the, this behavior you can see also in the CMB, just uh, in a sketchy way. You probably have seen all the CMB spectrum. You have a kind of plateau, then you have the peaks, and then you have the decrease of the spectrum. And in some sense, in this regime, in this range, you have exactly scales which are uh, so la uh, large that uh, they are not oscillating. Okay, so this will be practically scales which are uh, larger than the gene's length. And uh, in this regime, of course, since you are uh, most of the epoch of uh, evolution, you are in the matter, uh, sorry, in the radiation domination, the growth of this is not very, very big. In this regime here, you start to have the oscillations. So you have less lam the lambda gene, so you have the sound waves. And the first peak is exactly, if you want, the horizon scale at the CMB, because this is exactly the first contraction peak of the, of the fluctuation. So the fluctuation starts to become dynamical when k becomes sufficiently small, and then contracts one time, and this gives you the first contraction peak. This instead is a rarefaction peak. This is a, a, uh, sorry, this is a rarefaction peak. This is again a contraction peak, and so on. Remember here, in principle, in the fluctuation, you have, of course, peaks and draw. But here you are plotting the uh, CK 
which is quadratic. So this is always a power spectrum. So in the power spectrum, uh, you, it's like plotting a sine square. Okay, you have always peaks both for the minima and for the maxima. So this one is the first contraction peak. So the odd peaks are contraction peaks, and the even peaks are rarefaction peaks. Okay, and then in this uh, in this region you have silk damping. So you start to have oscillation on scales which are small or which are of the comparable size to the uh, to the um, to the length of uh, um, um, or the, the the mean free path and also to the size of the last scattering surface. So you, you see that in that sense, this is why this first peak of the CMB is also giving you exactly this important information about what was the sound horizon or the, what was the scale of the Hubble parameter at uh, the uh, decoupling of the CMB. And uh, the evolution of this scale is also something we can uh, measure and we can actually follow this peak in the evolution of the universe. This is nothing else as the baryonic acoustic oscillation peak as well. Okay, if you heard about it. Now, uh, I am also here a little bit uh, generalizing in the sense that, of course, these fluctuations are fluctuations in the baryons. And the baryons uh, are not the dark matter. Okay, so when I was solving here the equation, I was mostly solving from fluctuation in the dark matter and not really in the baryons. The fluctuation in the baryons tend to want, would like to follow the fluctuation in the dark matter, but as long as uh, they are coupled with the photon and there is a pressure, they are not really able completely. Okay, so in that sense, uh, this is also uh, another effect one has to really take into account if you want to do the computation properly, and uh, therefore you have that the if you want this uh, structure here forms first in the dark matter and only later the baryon fall into the over densities already present by the dark matter. So does that mean that uh, even if you had 30%, like when we say 30% of the energy budget of the universe is matter, if you had all of it in baryonic matter, we still wouldn't have been able to form structure? Well, if the baryon number or the baryon density would remain the same as we see, we would not. Because indeed, if I would put here, instead of the matter density, the baryon density, the baryon density is much smaller. It's one-fifth. Right, but uh, like how, is, how important is the coupling with photon, I guess? Well, it is also important. I mean, in the case of coupling of with photons, you see that uh, here, in practice, instead of having Z equality, you would decouple really from the pressure only at Z uh, CMB, so a bit later. It, that would be not a big uh, drama, but of course, it would, then much worse would be if we keep the same uh, baryon density, but we drop the matter density, the cold dark matter density. Then, of course, here we would have a much smaller time. So instead of being something of the order of thousand, we will get something order of hundred, as uh, so one factor of five shorter. And uh, this will indeed not be enough. In some sense, you would expect uh, then the structure to be much uh, less uh, uh, present as uh, we see them. And indeed, this is excluded. OK. Now, let me go to the final thing. Uh, well, actually, not the final. Uh, the final of the lecture connecting uh, inflation to um, to the thermal universe, because I had promised actually that this lecture will go to the thermal universe. So let's try to go there. Yes, so in principle, this one is what happens to the fluctuations. The fluctuations are generating during inflation, they go out of the horizon, they come back, etc. But in the meantime, of course, inflation ends. So what happens there? And the idea is that, as I said, inflation ends where the field starts to uh, move too fast, so, uh, or, to, or uh, depending on the type of model, when you uh, you have, for example, also uh, instability in some other direction. That's also possible. 
Yeah, so this goes to the under the name of reheating. Now, the first question you could ask me is why reheating? Well, because in the old days the idea was that you started from a thermal state, then you had inflation, for example, triggered by a grand unified phase transition or whatever. This uh, uh, inflation was diluting again everything and throwing away practically or putting, um, yeah, leading to zero all the, the particle density and energy densities. And then you had to reheat uh, the universe after inflation. Okay? Nowadays, of course, uh, we don't care so much of what happened before inflation. One reason is because we never know. I mean, the observation we see are all for epoch, which, uh, for example, also the fluctuation, a fluctuation which left the horizon during inflation. And it's very, very improbable that we will be able, ever able to see something uh, what happened before inflation. In principle, it's not impossible, of course, if the inflationary epoch is very short. We could start at the same time to see scales coming back to, uh, at the horizon scale to be uh, scales which actually were related to, uh, to the epoch before inflation. But at the moment, as I said, the CMB looks pretty homogeneous and uh, you can explain the homogeneity only if you assume that uh, in some sense inflation lasted long enough to really, uh, if you want, uh, give you a complete homogeneous uh, universe within this case we are observing until now. Uh, and the, the other issue is, of course, that we do not really need to have a thermal universe before inflation, OK? So what happened before inflation is, uh, in principle, there are models where you could think that inflation goes on forever in the past. So like something like eternal inflation. Or you could think that you start inflation from a tunneling from some process or uh, yeah, depending on the, what you type your theory you are interested in, you could uh, think what is the initial state, uh, the, the initial, if you want, um, from where you start infl inflating. Uh, if you want, this is and goes also under the name of the problem of the initial condition. So in some sense, to start inflation, you need to have already some, uh, as, as we saw, for example, some conditions satisfied, in particular that the, uh, the gradients of the field are sufficiently small, etc. But this is, uh, I, I will not go into that. In principle, this is, in some sense, something you should uh, uh, try to explain. Or you can also explain just by uh, probability, in the sense that there will be some part of the universe where you are sufficiently uh, flat. Um, OK, so apart from that, there, what is the idea of reheating? As I said, the usually you have the potential where you do inflation. Uh, let me take the usual phi square, uh, m square phi square potential. And then you have inflation here. But then at a certain point, point, the field picks up speed. And then inflation ends. And the field starts oscillating around the minimum of the potential. OK, if the field oscillates around the minimum of the potential, it should be clear that immediately this is, uh, in some sense, is not uh, in an inflationary epoch. It can still dominate the energy density of the universe. But in this case, you will have a solution of the field that you can write more or less an amplitude which is time dependent and a, a oscillation. And generically, you would expect the frequency of oscillation to be more or less the mass of the field, because this is nothing else as the quadratic term in the potential. Okay? And here, if you have a small field value, you would get that the mass term is the dominant part of the potential. So you can look at what happens in this case. You can compute the, the derivative of this. Then, of course, let's assume, well, let's first uh, take this derivative of And then I have the derivative of A. OK? Now, what happens here? Usually, as I said, the derivative of the cosine is the driven by the mass, because the mass is the frequency of the oscillations. On the other hand, you would expect the 
uh, amplitude of the oscillation to decrease with another scale. So if you want, I would expect the A prime, well, let me take a dot, not a prime, sorry. You would expect that this should be proportional to the Hubble parameter. Okay? Because it's the Hubble parameter is the dilution which would actually suppress the oscillation. If, if you remember, this exponential minus 3 half HT was actually what we were uh, having as a solution for the field in the original uh, equation. Of course, in this we are not um, more in that regime, but you still expect that the friction term will just actually decrease the, uh, the amplitude and will de decrease with a rate which is driven practically by the Hubble parameter. Now, in this time here, the Hubble parameter has decreased. And uh, remember, the Hubble parameter is again, well, we'll compute it in a minute, but it's connected again to the potential and the kinetic energy. Uh, so we can, well, we let's compute it. We have that the Hubble parameter is 8 pi gn over 3. I have 1 half the kinetic energy which here I can write the first t term. Well, let's write it, uh, everything. A. OK, so this one is the kinetic part. And then, of course, I have the potential part, which is just a 1 half m square a of t square cosine square. OK? Now it should be clear that if I can neglect a dot of t, you see immediately that I get m square sine square here, m square cosine square here. So what I get is actually that the Hubble parameter square The first leading term would be nothing else as 1 half m square a square of t. And then you have the additional pieces which are proportional to a dot of t or a dot of t uh, squared. So you get, for example, um, a of t, a dot of t sine mt cosine mt and etc. I'm not writing all of it. It's now, if we assume that a t a dot is smaller than m, you see that you have h square. It's all dominated by this term. And uh, uh, therefore, you see also that h So you have immediately that if the field uh, excursion, so the, the, the amplitude of the field, is smaller than the Planck mass, this h square is less than the m square. OK? It means that when you reach this epoch, you can actually neglect its whole sense, or at least the H will not be the domina dominant term in the evolution anymore. The dominant term will be the uh, oscillation, and the oscillation time scale will be much faster than the expansion of the universe. OK? Moreover, you can also see that if you try to get an uh, average, if you want, of uh, H square, this term actually will not uh, contribute, so you also have uh, only contribution to a dot squared. You could, in principle, also look at what is the derivative of h in this uh, epoch. Uh -huh. And if you remember, we had it also last uh, yesterday, that uh, the h dot is nothing else. Again, this is still valid, because you always have the scalar field is minus 1 half phi dot square over m square Planck. And in this case, therefore, you can substitute uh, the uh, value of phi dot again. 
you see again that you have the amplitude and uh, you can rewrite it as something like h square the sine square of mt okay so you see that the h is actually changing uh, with a in principle with time and you can try to solve uh, of course this equation uh, you can uh, it's a you have of course yeah in principle you have to plug in again the a and if you try to solve this equation you find out that the um, the behavior of h is practically the behavior of a matter dominance as that we see uh, already so I have also the equation and the solution, but uh, so you practically have, uh, uh, let me rewrite it here and give you the um, basic idea at least. So you have practically that the integration is of the h over h square is equal to minus 3 the integration in dt of the sine square and uh, if you do uh, in principle if you want to be uh, exact uh, here you actually you have to add a time dependent phase because you are uh, in some sense uh, taking uh, into account the if you want you could use it to take into the fund the depend of a from the phase and um, sorry we are done idiot that ah. it just complicates my life so here you have uh, this integral of 1 over h by 1 over h in t initial this is equal if you integrate this uh, sine square you obtain uh, the uh, solution to be minus 3 half t minus t initial plus the oscillation Well, it's a simple differential equation. You can probably find a solution or, or do a solution. The important thing is that if you look at here, if you invert this equation, the dominant piece, which is this one, this one is oscillating. And in principle, it's uh, suppressed, though, by the mass. OK, so if you have a large mass, this will actually be uh, negligible. So this is the dominant piece. And this behavior gives you exactly h of t is equal to 2 thirds 1 of over t and this is exactly the behavior I we discussed before for the matter dominance so this means uh, that uh, the oscillating field around the minimum behave like a matter okay now usually you could look at it also in a different way usually people compute the average pressure and the average density and you can show that average pre pressure is zero because they, uh, if you want the energy coming from the kinetic term and the energy coming from the uh, potential are uh, practically the same and uh, if you have a minus sign uh, between them you got you practically cancel them but I find it a little bit more interesting to, to really solve the equation for the evolution of the Hubble parameter and you can see immediately that the behavior is like matter so the idea is that therefore you have during the time of reheating or wh while the, the, the inflaton is oscillating you have an epoch of matter domination So the picture we had also the other day of the Hubble parameter or the Hubble uh, inverse Yes, yeah, so, or, le or let me plot the, the scale factor directly 
Okay? So the idea is that we start with inflation and then the scale factor grows exponentially. Then we start with reheating, the uh, field is oscillating around the, the minimum and in this case you have a matter dominance, T at the two thirds. Then you reheat the universe and we get to that in a minute and then we have the T to the one half for the radiation dominance. And then finally we will have another matter dominance, uh, sorry, at t two thirds at the end. This last is the matter dominance we uh, had, uh, we discussed just now, between the quality time to the time where the cosmological constant takes over. And then in principle you would have another inflationary epoch today, starting today, due to the cosmological constant. Now the important point is what happens, how can you go from this matter dominance of the field oscillating to, um, uh, to uh, the uh, radiation epoch. And this is usually uh, considered, uh, so there are different ways to do that, this is exactly the reheating procedure. And uh, you have the simplest way to do it is just to have a field decaying. Okay. So, for example, we could have how does the inflaton reheat? So, the easiest thing to do is perturbative decay. So perturbative decays means uh, up to now I always wrote the inflaton just the potential depending on the inflaton but of course you could have an interaction of the inflaton with some other field. So for example I can have a Yukawa interaction of the inflaton with the fermion or you can have also uh, either a, a trilinear coupling of the inflaton with a scalar field let me call it um, ooh, um, psi, uh, chi-square, or, or even a quartic coupling. Notice that since we have a vacuum expectation value for the phi field, uh, the quartic coupling will also give you a trilinear coupling. So in that sense, uh, it can be also co all come from the same coupling. Then, of course, you would have, uh, for example, the process where the inflaton will decay into two fermions or two, bos two, uh, two bosons. So either psi by psi or chi by chi. And uh, this, for example, it's uh, of course governed by the lifetime of the inflaton. And uh, usually you can just, uh, d well, there are different types of, uh, but the, the expectation is that you would have a coupling divided some pi's, the mass of the inflaton. Okay? Sorry, I wrote it with a small m. Now the idea then is that the f apart from the uh, evolution of the universe, which decreases the fluctuation or the oscillation of the field around the minimum, there will be also a drain in the field coming from the fact that the, the modes of the field will start to decay into other particles. And usually the, uh, one of the approximations one can do, which is uh, the easiest thing to compute, is to assume the particle you produce, usually you do not produce them in a thermal state, of course. Here, for so example, you have a two-body decay, so given the mass, so if you assume that the fermion or the bosons are massless, what you would produce is exactly uh, two particles with the energy one-half of the mass of the inflaton field. Okay? So this doesn't look uh, like a, a thermal spectra at all. But the assumption is usually that these psi and chi particles have sufficiently strong interaction among their cells, could be for example a gauge interaction or something uh, else, such that they would thermalize among their cells. Okay? And this is usually uh, called also instant 
reheating assumption the instant reheating in reality are two assumptions one assumption is that the inflaton modes all decay at the a time which equal to one over gamma or if you want at the time equal to their lifetime and it, of course you could do it with, with the exponential decay if you want uh, it doesn't usually change a lot and the other uh, assumption is that once you produce the particle they instantaneously uh, thermalize okay and the idea there is that the time it takes for thermalizing is much shorter than every cosmological time like the Hubble inverse or something like that and in that case, you can write the condition of decay would be exactly that the gamma 5 is equal to the, the Hubble, OK? Because remember, the Hubble parameter is also what uh, is also setting the time in the universe. And when the Hubble has reaches the size of the inverse lifetime, then you are practically at the time where you would expect the particle to decay. And uh, you can therefore use this, uh, this condition if you have particles which are in thermal equilibrium, and uh, these to these we will come back also later or tomorrow, you would have actually that the, uh, the density of the, the Hubble parameter you can write again as 8 pi gn over 3, the density. Okay, of the particles. But if the particles are in thermal equilibrium, you know how to write the density as a function of the temperature of the thermal bath to the fourth. And this is nothing else as a pi square. We saw it also yesterday. Well, for the pressure, but this one is for the energy density, T to the fourth. One half. Okay? So this one gives you already an idea on what is this reheating temperature, because I can invert this relation, and I can write down that then the reheating temperature, which is the temperature as this uh, in some sense at this time here, this is would be exactly the time here uh, of decay, or if you want also the time of reheating. You can uh, invert that relation, and you find that the time of reheating, or the temperature reheating, sorry, it's uh, some 3 and pi factors, a g star factor. Uh, g star here there counts the number of degrees of freedom, uh, which are relativistic at that epoch. And you have gamma phi times m Planck. to the one half. OK. So you see immediately that you could, uh, first of all, I mean, this is the one possible approximation that, in some sense, the scalar field oscillates as long as the time, as long t uh, time passes, which is corresponding to its lifetime. And then it decays. And it produces immediately a thermal bath of particles, which uh, then uh, it's uh, either fermion or, or bosons, which has a temperature which is connected exactly to the decay rate of the inflaton, uh, uh, rescaled by the Planck scale. So you see immediately that uh, in that case, the relevant scale for the reheating temperature is actually the mass of the inflaton or the decay rate. And it doesn't really depend very strongly on the potential energy. Okay? But usually what you find out due to the constraints of inflation is that this quantity gamma is always uh, smaller, if you want, than the scale of inflation. And uh, therefore the reheating temperature is uh, at least usually smaller than the square, the fourth power. So it's smaller than the one fourth of the, poten of the energy during inflation. And this one is, in some sense, the simplest uh, way to, to see it. And if you plot the densities, you would have the density of the scalar field. So at the enduring inflation is practically constant, because it's a cosmological constant, rho 
Then you would have uh, the a to the cubed uh, the behavior during the uh, matter dominance. And then you will have the practically the decay as a, uh, if, if you want, instantaneous decay at the time equal to uh, the decay time. And at the same time, you would have at that time a generation of a, a density, which will be a relativistic uh, density. So it will go down like a to the minus 4. But it will be produced, if you want, instanta instantaneously at from the decay of the uh, inflaton. Now, if you want, you can also write the equation more continuous instead of having this instantaneous uh, decay approximation. So you have to just to write again the equation for the density of the inflaton and the equation for the density of radiation as a function of time which are more or less the similar as the ones we had already. Um, only that, of course, you have to add a decay term for the inflaton, which uh, loses inflaton, and uh, a production term coming from the inflaton in the equation for the radiation. Wow, I am already at the end. That's impossible. <laughs> OK. So what is this again? Why is this is uh, more than? Well, it's not absolutely, uh, here in this condition is not uh, in some sense uh, clear if it is smaller or larger, but usually the mass, since you have enduring inflation, for example, for a polynomial inflation you have the uh, inflaton uh, potential is m square phi square, for example. Now phi square is usually pretty large. And m square you have to put uh, actually below the Planck scale uh, due to the normalization of the power spectrum to get the 10 to the minus 10. I didn't uh, do the computation, but you can easily see that if you plug it in in the formula I had before for the power spectrum and you want it to be 10 to the minus 10, the mass has to be in an intermediate scale, something like 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12 GeV. And then if you put uh, you the gamma there, you see that uh, the temperature you compute out of it, it's usually smaller than the uh, scale of... Uh, of uh because, of course, you could also think of another approximation. You could think, OK, I have a certain energy density in the inflaton, which is determined by the potential during inflation. And I just transfer it one to one into radiation without even having an oscillatory phase. And that, in some sense, would be the maximal uh, energy density you would expect to have if you don't want to produce energy density from nothing. Okay? But what happens here is that usually the gamma is sufficiently small that there is some time delay between the end of inflation and the production of the radiation, so that the reheating temperature typically is smaller than the scale. So you, as you see here, the density in the then it decreases during the uh, oscillation of the field. Okay? <coughs> and then what you transfer, so, okay, here I practically probably, yeah, I was a bit misleading because I put the heating temperature a bit higher. It could be, but uh, usually it's not as high as this. So, yes, let me rewrite it, replot it. So the reheating temperature could be, in principle, a little bit higher than the density of the uh, here, but it can never be practically higher than that. And usually, it can also be uh, smaller. So it depends how long it takes to, to, do, uh, to do the reheating. OK, so unfortunately, I am completely uh, out of time. And uh, what I just want to mention is, of course, this is a kind of perturbative be uh, behavior. In practice, at reheating, you have also a lot of non-perturbative processes that could happen. In particular, if you have coupling of this form, you see that if you have here an oscillating field, or also here, you have again a time dependent mass also for these other fields. So if you write down the equation for these other fields, you can find also strange things happening. Well, for the case of the fermion, you could also have the mass of the fermion cross zero. And then usually it's the best time to produce a particle because you don't pay any price, it is massless. And indeed, this is, for example, for fermions, what happens that usually you would have, for example, some kind of discrete process which produces particle every time the mass of the fermion crosses a zero. For the scalars, you have mo or even more complicated uh, behaviors. You could get uh, negative masses, again, 
due to the oscillation of phi here. Or also, even if you have a phi square, which will always give you a positive mass, you could still have non-perturbative production of modes uh, through uh, what is called the Mathieu instability, <coughs> which I don't have time to discuss. But uh, this, in some sense, opens up also the, a lot of uh, more possibilities during the epoch of reheating, or preheating, as it's called, when it is non-perturbative. And in that sense, uh, there is no standard way to reheat the universe. There are many different models and many different uh, mechanisms that you can use. And um, yes, and it's still, in some sense, an open question exactly how reheating happened and what is especially the reheating temperature. So at what temperature we had a real thermal bath again in the universe. We know, of course, that uh, this we will discuss now tomorrow. We know, of course, that we had a thermal bath at the epoch of nucleosynthesis, which is on the MeV en energies, but we don't really know very much uh, at uh, what, uh, what is the highest temperature we had in the universe. Good. So I conclude here, and tomorrow we will go to discuss the thermal universe finally. Uh, I hope I will be able to cover enough. Thank you.